Hi, my name is Carla Lovell, and I'm a consultant with the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia, NCTA, and the Program for Teaching East Asia at University of Colorado Boulder. The upcoming interview is with Professor Jeffrey Wasserstrom about his recently co-edited book, Chinese Characters, Profiles of Fast-Changing Lives in a Fast-Changing Land. The interview is part of an online resource collection showcasing useful materials and resources for K-12 teachers developed as part of the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia. So first, I would like to introduce Jeff. Thank you for coming today. It's my pleasure to be here. And Jeffrey Westerstrom is a Chancellor's Professor of History at University of California, Irvine. He is a regular contributor to academic journals, newspapers, magazines, and blogs, including China Quarterly, Journal of History, World History, The Huffington Post, Time, and The Los Angeles Times and New York Times. He currently serves as the co-editor of the Asia section for the Los Angeles Review of Books and editor of the Journal of Asian Studies. Jeff is currently working on a new book on the Boxer Rebellion. His recent publications include China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, and Global Shanghai, 1850 to 2010. Jeff was a founder of the very useful Irvine-based blog electronic magazine, The China Beat. Jeff has been a contributor to K-12 professional development on East Asia for many years. He was a national co-director for NCTA at Indiana University, and he has presented at NCTA seminars, teacher summer institutes, and one-day programs. The topic today that we're going to be talking about is, is Jeff's recent co-edited book, Chinese Characters, Profiles of Fast-Changing Lives and Fast-Changing Land. Again, he co-edited this with Anjali Shah and published it with the University of California Press in 2012. So again, thank you for coming, and we're going to go over some of these, a few questions that we've talked about ahead of time. But first, just tell us what the main goal of the book is. The main goal of the book um, is to dispel any notion that China is inhabited by one kind of person. Um, even though we all know that China has more than a billion people and they're bound to be different, in a lot of the coverage of China, particularly in sort of soundbite-driven media, you get the idea that the Chinese people think X or the Chinese people are upset by Y. And the Chinese government will also sometimes try to say, for example, something will be said and they'll say, that hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, as though there's this unitary subject out there that is the Chinese people. And what we wanted to do was by bringing together these very distinctive individuals, each of whom are profiled by a different contributor in a different setting, in a different set of life experiences, to kind of explode any notion of China as a homogeneous land. And and so when did the idea for this book first come out? And, um, and how did you end up collaborating with your co-editor? Well, the idea for the book came in part because a lot of the things that I was really enjoying reading were um, books that, by individual journalists, um, very talented journalists with a long-term commitment to China, who often their, their books would feature the experiences of individual people um, who they had met. And mm -hmm. I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a sampler where you could get be exposed to the likes of Peter Hessler, Evan Osnos, Ian Johnson, to name three of the journalists I particularly enjoyed reading. Um, Ian Johnson and Peter Hessler through their books, Evan Osnos through his New Yorker profiles of individual people. I thought, wouldn't it be great to bring together um, pieces of that kind, focusing on human experience that humanized China's experience undergoing fast changes, with some chapters by the kinds of academics who were writing more accessibly about China as well. And so the idea would be it would be a sampler of both some of the best journalistic writing and some of the best scholarly writing that moved toward the journalistic and journalistic writing that moved toward the scholarly and look at this kind of convergence between the two. So it seemed natural to co-edit it with a journalist. And so Anjali Shah is somebody who had been um, working as a journalist in various parts of Asia, not focusing exclusively on China because I thought it would also help to have somebody who would have the sensibility of what might be interesting about China to somebody who wasn't thinking about China all the time. And it evolved, the book evolved fairly organically out of Peter Hessler coming through Irvine to give a talk. We had been bringing, to, bringing through um, journalists periodically to talk uh, in dialogue with an academic and to, to talk about that kind of borderland between 
journalism and and spent the car ride just sort of brainstorming with him about could he see a place for a book like this. And he's been the most successful writer on um, China in English, uh, on contemporary China in America for some time now. And he, he thought there was a place for that book and agreed by the time we got to Pomona uh, to contribute to it. And I knew that that would help get other people want to be involved in it. And in Pomona, Anjali Shah was coming to his talk. So the three of us got to talk and it sort of grew from that that point. And we drew in some of the people you mentioned, China Beat. We, we extended, in China Beat, we had been working with contributions between journalism and academia. We'd actually turned the tables on journalists and sometimes interviewed them for the blog uh, and talked about our experiences as academics being interviewed by journalists. Um, so the book evolved in that way and drew on some of the networks we'd established through China Beat. And so the what I think is interesting is you touch on a little bit, but tell me a little bit more about what makes this book so different from other books on contemporary China. Well, often um, the really compelling books about China, well, there is a whole set of, of books about China that take what I call an Olympian view of it, which which pontificate about the China, the 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 Chinese um, economy or the or Chinese politics and how they how it develops. And China in the 21st century, what everyone needs to know, could be called that kind of a book that sets out to answer the big China China questions. But there are also the books that I found particularly compelling are ones that try to just humanize the Chinese experiences of living through these big changes. But you often have to choose if you're picking one book. Do you want to read you know, this wonderful book out there, The Last Days of Old Beijing, that look at one Beijing neighborhood living through these changes? Or Factory Girls by Leslie Chong, another book that I, I love, and she's in Chinese characters, um, that looks at one group of people, uh, female factory workers, as they experience the changes. What, what didn't seem to, to exist was something like this that looked at each chapter looking at a different person or set of individuals, often a different part of China, a different generation would be the focus, a different social group that would give you a kind of kaleidoscopic view of the country. And so I think we're getting a sense, but these profiles, what are you thinking that secondary teachers would find them most useful? What do you think sort of, as you're thinking of the book, what would be most useful from these profiles? Well, I think what's great about um, the best individual life writing about China is that while the Olympian view can end up making you think of how China is different from America, when you look at individual lives, you're often drawn into things that parallel American lives. So I think as a teaching tool in K-12 classrooms, one of the things would be to just encourage your students to take one or another chapter and see if they can think of anybody in their family, for example, that's had an experience that parallels the experience of somebody in, in that chapter or an institution or a setting that parallels one in America, and then probe what the differences are. So one of the chapters that I think is, is very effective is about a Westerner living in China, two Westerners living in China, one from Canada, one from England, who are sending their child to um, a local public school. So the child is not Chinese, but is growing up um, is growing up more part of Chinese culture than um, his parents will ever be because he's going to this elementary school. And this is in some ways a very exotic setting and they talk about, you know, what is it like for them to be in China and have their child more embedded. But it's actually experienced very like that, um, that my wife tells me about. She's a librarian at a school, an elementary school in Southern California, where a lot of the students are, um, their, their family is originally from Mexico, and the students are growing up in an English language environment while Spanish is being largely taught at home. The children are being more internal to American culture um, than, their, than their parents are. And so it's an experience that's totally different, but actually quite parallel in some ways. And then in the chapter, you can look at things that are totally unlike what goes on in America. To um, a military site, the kid can go on the field trip, and all the other parents can go, 
but not the Western parents because it would be seen as a security threat. Right. So you have some ways in which the politics changes things. And so bringing it back a little more, what are some of the, just a few of the key themes that you're hoping a reader will walk away when they're thinking about contemporary China after reading, even if they've read two or three or four of the chapters? Well, I think one thing that comes through very clearly is the enormity of generational divides in a country that it's changing so quickly. The fact that um, people in China are um, a parent and a child may have differences in their exposures to technologies and popular culture and the world that makes as big a gulf between them as between a grandparent or a great-grandparent and a child uh, in the United States. I think getting that across is something that if you read through these, you start to appreciate. That's why we put fast-changing lives in a fast-changing land in there. The other thing that I bring out in the introduction is that because of the rapidity of change, an experience you often have talking with Chinese people is it feels as though they've lived more than one life. They've reinvented themselves multiple times during the last couple of decades of very rapid social and economic and cultural change, which is something that used to be remarked on about American lives. Europeans who came to America about 100 years ago talked about America as a land of reinvention and of opportunities and of surprising um, rises from one status to another. And so I think getting across the idea that China in some ways parallels that American experience when we were a rapidly industrializing, rapidly urbanizing country. So I think that sense of change and sense of diversity and um, also just I'd like them to get a sense of just beautiful possibilities of different kinds of writing okay. coming out of China. And so that sort of leads me to this next question. And and sometimes, you know, China's getting a lot of coverage. Sometimes journalists are often criticized um, within uh, within for presenting too simplistic a view of China, while on the other hand, scholars on Chinese studies are sometimes seen as getting closer to the truth, but failing to be able to communicate what they know in an accessible enough way for non-specialists to understand. So could you talk a little bit about this issue and how you see yourself and this book fitting in and um, talking maybe about that borderland a little more and the responsibility of either side um, in terms of painting and presenting a picture of China? Yeah, I, th I think I used to have more of a conflictual sense of my relationship with journalists because you get, sometimes as an academic, you get interviewed and then you, you talk to a journalist for an hour and then they use one sentence you used. And it might not be your favorite sentence. It might, you know, in, in the worst case scenario, you're saying, the one thing I would hate anybody to think about China is X and then you're quoted as saying X about China. But over time, I started having more and more experiences going to China of talking to journalists or even watching events with journalists, and I realized we were asking very similar questions. There are different constraints. The best of the journalists were trying to find out, which is what a good scholar does. There's something you don't understand and you try to find out. And you might have different ways of communicating what you found out. You might have different methods. You might have more Academics usually have more time to pursue a single story. But I was struck by how similar the best of the journalists were in the way they approached things. They were reading widely. They were often reading our work. They were tending to read, though, more frequently the academics who cared more about writing excessively, which mm -hmm. I've, I've cared about. Um, and so I started to think about the the overlaps as opposed to the the sharp divergences between these these two groups of people and some of what we have in common virtually everybody in the book has been traveling to china quite regularly over an extended period of time so we've seen some of these changes and we've known chinese people going through some of these changes and so that provides another kind of common thread between the kind of um, work and discussions we're both doing and I still get, I get frustrated by some things about the mainstream media coverage of um, China, but I've increasingly thought academics shouldn't just complain about that. They should get into the mix and try to write back to it and try to correct it. And online venues give you an opportunity. You can be interviewed by a journalist, and then if you don't like the way you were quoted, blog about what you said that got left out of the story. 
and um, journalists can sometimes, um, when they're involved in conversations with academics, tell us what we could do differently that would make it easier for them to learn from us. And so I think that this book is an example of that. One thing that's left out of this is the book is largely, um, largely Western writers on China. And there are, of course, excellent Chinese writers mm -hmm. on China. And one of the things that I think would be ideal um, in using a book like this would be pairing it with some of the most evocative fiction coming out of China and also pair it with some works by Chinese journalists in this vein. There's a book, China Candid, that I like a great deal that was done by an oral historian journalist who's, who's Chinese living now outside of China but goes back and writes prof profiles of individuals um, working together with an Australian academic, Jeremy Barme, mm -hmm. who's not in this book but is another person who works that line between academia and journalism, I think, very effectively. Yeah, and I, so was there a particular moment, I think you touched a little bit, that, and you can remember in your career when you realized that you wanted to explore the borderland and between journalism and scholarship, and uh, do you remember that moment? Well, I know, it. I remember it very clearly because I had written a dissertation on Chinese student movements, and it came. I finished the dissertation in 1989 right as the world was focusing on Chinese student movements with the Tiananmen Uprising and the June 4th massacre. And I realized that I thought there were things about the history of student movements that should be getting more attention in the coverage and discussion of it. And I found out that when I tried to sit down and write something short, short enough to go into a newspaper and accessible about it, I, I just couldn't do it. I hadn't developed those muscles and those skills. And then I was very fortunate to be asked to be a consultant for a documentary film about the movement that was being made that became the movie The Gate of Heavenly Peace. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the little bit that I little bits that I could insert into that movie through as a consultant would end up reaching many more people with some of my ideas about the movement than the journal articles I would write. And so I I wanted to be prepared the next time something that I was interested in had this kind of popular appeal to be able to do things that would become part of that discussion of it, even if I wasn't fortunate enough to be asked to be involved with the talented filmmakers who are making something that would become a front light episode about it. So it's really been part of your, it's since the beginning of your career. It's it like, was, it was, yeah, so through that convergence. And I think some people have that experience of moving toward popular engagement at a later point in their life, maybe when an issue comes up that they're passionate about. For me, the, just the fact that it happened to be what I had chosen as a dissertation topic, not thinking of it as timely at all. I was working on pre-1949 student movements. When I started work on, it, on this in 1984, there hadn't been a really big student movement in China for quite a while. So I thought I was doing a kind of safely historical topic, but it immediately had that past meets the present issue, and I've never let go of that. And I think if you're interested in an element of history's relevance for the present, there's even more of a drive to find ways to communicate about it that non-specialists can be engaged with. And so one question I'm thinking about, though, is 10 to 15 years ago, when you started, as you said, that popular media related to China were more, they were more infrequent. I mean, you didn't see a story every day about China. And sometimes when you did see the story, they were very inaccurate, or there were just generalizations. And today, it's not surprising to see media coverage daily about China. And so is it your hope that that you've been able to improve some of that coverage or some of the work you've done? Or have you seen improvement in the coverage? I think there's been a lot of improvement in the coverage um, in various ways. One way is that journalists used to be much more confined to Beijing. And now there's more writing about China, both being done by journalists traveling more and by people who are freelance writers outside of the regular channels of journalism who are living in one or another city. And this was something we tried to do with China Beat, was we were curious how one event would be playing out in different parts of China. So if we knew somebody who was a graduate student doing research in an out-of-the-way part of China or just somebody who was working for a local magazine or something in one part of China, we would get them 
to say, how is what's happening in Chongqing or Chengdu different from what the Beijing-centered coverage of it is? We're seeing more and more journalists and others uh, going to China, writing about China who have very good language skills because they started studying China Chinese at a younger age. A lot of people who are very talented have gone to China as a study abroad experience, whereas in my generation, they would have gone to France or Italy. China is no longer seen as a really hard place to go. It's seen as a normal place for a college student to go. And then that college student, if they end up being a journalist or an academic, has an experience of being having been an 18-year-old in China to bring to the table when they write about it. So there's a lot of things that are very positive about the, the change in viewpoints on China that are coming out. Unfortunately, we've moved to an era of more and more fear of China, which drives a kind of stereotyped view of whenever we fear a country, there are stereotypes about it. And of course, people working on Islam deal with this even more powerfully than those of us working on China. But fear can lead to a kind of distortion and simplification of a story. Exaggerated hopes about a country can also lead to, a dis to an exaggeration and oversimplification of the story. So in some ways, I think the situation is much, much better. There's proliferation of good writing on China. I think academics are starting to care more about communicating in accessible ways than they were in a kind of hyper-specialized period of 20 years ago or so. So all that's to the good. And yet, the motivation I've often had to write against the grain of what I see as a vision of China as uniformly moving in one direction, either a hopeful direction or a scary direction, and people exaggerating that, I feel like I often am still writing against the grain of that kind of simplistic view of China, even though there's much better material out there about China. It's not always what gets read the most. And that's what I was thinking about. What are things that are still not right about the coverage or things that you'd hope to change? You touched on that, you know, trying to make it more nuanced, more diverse. And yeah, and I, I think now there, it's never, there's never been a better time for there being good online um, daily writing on China to go to. You have China Digital Times, which is a website that's devoted largely to um, media coverage of China and things that are done in China, of censorship and freedom of speech. Tea Leaf Nation is a really inspiring group of mostly young writers on China with very good Chinese language skills, some native Chinese, some, some foreigners, that largely tracks what is being said on social media, on, um, on the Twitter-like microblogs that are very important in China um, as expressions of opinion things like that. There's something called China File at the Asia Society, which is a, a wonderful online source, and something called the China Story out of Australia National University. And these are showing this proliferation of, of nuanced views of China and insights into what ordinary Chinese people are saying and thinking about things. And yet, many, many Americans are kind of inevitably going to be getting a kind of um, soundbite driven view of China, no matter how much good material is out there. So that's, that's the challenge. And I think our fear of potential displacement by China or challenge or plays into a desire for simple, reassuring, or, or kind of titillatingly fearful stories about China. So I think we continue to have the battle between nuanced views that are saying there is no one China story, there are multiple perspectives, there's no one Chinese view of anything, battling against the pressures of a time um, when busy people are going to only have time for a little bit of, of material about China, and they'll often be drawn to the most reductionist views. Would you mind just speaking a moment for what's driving the, this sort of fearful view, or what do you see sort of bringing us to this moment of looking at China, you know, it seems to swing, but as you say, you, you see that now. Well, we've had a series, an ongoing, what I, I talk about uh, as the American China dream and the American China nightmare. And the American China dream is always this idea that China's on the cusp of converting to our ways. Americans have had a fantasy of massive conversions to Christianity early on, and then later, as 
peaking in Tiananmen, this can on the verge of democratization that will make China somehow right in step with us. But battling with that has been a long tradition of, of yellow peril fears and then red menace fears of China's enormous size being a scary thing for us, enormous population, and an idea of, of China being irreconcilably different. And then I think when, when China boomed economically, it brought both of these to a new fevered pitch. Mm -hmm. When it was booming economically, an American fantasy, an updated version of the American China dream was, you know, they're going to McDonald's, they're shopping at malls, they're very soon going to want the kind of political system we have. They'll want more choices at the supermarket and then they'll want more choices at the ballot box. And so the idea was China was once again on the cusp of becoming like us. In this case, conversion to capitalism would lead to democracy. But at the same time, the economic power of China and the rise of China and China not doing that, not becoming like us, still being an authoritarian political system, led to a revival of the fear of China as a, as a threat to us. And I think telling human stories about China, telling bringing in the complexity of the country and the variety of people and making it clear that even though um, even though Chinese do not get to vote for who's in power, that this doesn't mean that they don't have varied opinions. And it doesn't mean that the government isn't interested in what popular opinion is and trying to shape it and trying to turn it as well as trying to control it. I think that's one way of saying that it's, it's really not all about us. The biggest China stories are what this enormous population of diverse individuals are living through in what can seem to them for different ways very exciting times and very fearful times, but often not for the reasons that we project onto it. Mm -hmm. And so just to wrap up, how has the reception of the book, and have you been surprised, pleased? Um, what has been some of the um, um, anything? Well, I've been, we've been pleased that it got reviewed in the uh, Wall Street Journal online and it got reviewed in the LA Times and that review was, um, was republished in other newspapers and reviewers seem to get what we were after. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they don't have criticisms. Um, I've been, we've been pleased by the sort of after effects of, of the book in the sense that what we were hoping was that the contributors to it would see themselves as part of a network who would stay in dialogue with each other. And Anjali started a Tumblr page that then um, allows her to post together some of the new writing of different contributors to it, which then kind of carries the stories from the book forward and also provides yet another online window into China's diversity. So all that, all that has been good. The press has been happy with it. They um, trotted us out along with one of the contributors um, to an event for um, supporters of the press so we could talk about what we were doing. And they talked about it as a potential model for more books that could bridge that divide between um, academic and journalistic of the best kind writing. And, um, you know, China isn't the only place that could benefit from that kind of partnership and synergy, I think. So I'm very pleased about that. Great. Anything else you'd like to share with us? Well, we'd love it to be translated into Chinese, but so far that hasn't happened because we do see this as a dialogue between what we write about China and what people write within it. But there's a, night, a positive sign there is two of the contributors to the book, um, Peter Hessler and Leslie Chong, their books have been translated recently into Chinese and are doing very, very well in China. So I think that's a good sign of, of the stories of a human China told in a way that's sensitive to Chinese experience, but obviously from a perspective that's going to be different because um, writers who've grown up in another setting bring other things to the table in what they, what they find interesting about these Chinese stories. Well, thank you again. That's been a great pleasure. Thanks.